But in, in the time that we're, we, we're in now, I don't know that I've heard more complaining about ultrasound, ultrasound data and controversies going on there. Uh, and I sit in on some of the things with UGC and what's what's going on. I talk to breeders. I work the breed associations having been there 11 years and now I, I, an outsider and they call me about these kind of things. So um, what are we going to do in the new generation ultrasound units and what are new generation ultrasound units? And I've probably got uh, my particular thoughts on those, but I am going to share some data uh, that uh, where we did look at some of the newer equipment out there uh, and went across some labs to, to actually do that. Now that I, I go back to when I was in graduate school in 1990, I remember that this is a new technology we thought, but it had been around since 1950. Um, it wasn't really anything, any new, anything new. And then Brethauer comes along in, in the late 80s and, and he was working on the marbling deal. And uh, again, if I could be in the era of John Brethauer today, I'm curious where he would be on these new ultrasound units that are out there and where he would take the technology. I'm pretty confident where, what he would tell us uh, and I'll probably show some of that here uh, in a bit uh, in terms of where I think labs uh, might want to be. Now, the proficiency testing part of this thing, we, we kind of isolated that to three groups of people that uh, train uh, and do a good job of training technicians. And, and they have the labs that are running and processing data for breeders and or breed associations. We look at those. Uh, and if you look at the first one, Jim Stouffer, Patsy Houghton, uh, Lorna Pelton, they were on that first group uh, with that. Then they held ultrasound certification in 1989. It's hard to believe to me we've been certifying technicians that long, but we've been in this business quite a long time. And, and I'm probably going to share some things that uh, why did it take us as long to get this? We're still using A mode technology in some research that I'm seeing out in the field. Having come back to the university and I still see technicians out there using A mode. Um, and I'll share some results with that. Uh, here in a minute. How many of you have done split screen imaging? Samantha, you done any of that split screen? I still own a Loca 210. So I still can go out and collect 210 images just for fun to remember what, remember how bad it was back in graduate school. So uh, uh, yeah, exactly. It, it, but, but it's real. It's real. Now, this is the thing that probably happened to the industry that made us get to where we're going. If you go back in February of 2021, does anybody remember the percentage of prime cattle that were graded on one day in the industry? It was just over 12%. And I have to say that I think ultrasound was the reason that that happened. It wasn't just from looking at cattle and trying to make these, these predictions. Ultrasound did a great job, and we have to thank the American Angus Association for helping us get there. Uh, because all the data that, that they were collected over that time. But I remember in graduate school, 1989, Jim Stouffer flew to Lubbock, Texas, and he trained four of us. And he brought this cool little 17.2 centimeter probe, that guy you see up there. That probe is still out there today. They no longer make it. And we're going to try to address part of that uh, here in a minute. But it had a significant impact on what's going on in ultrasound. Um, BIF did say that we could start collecting IMF images and data and use it for breed association work, even though Keller kind of shared when that actually got put into their database. It didn't occur at that time, but uh, that's when they at least, and that again, Gene Rouse, Dole Wilson, uh, their great work is the reason we got to that point. And it wasn't because of Texas Tech, who was also involved in that business, uh, but Ronnie Green didn't lead the, the team the, the direction that Iowa State actually did. So I think they did a much better job. Now, the governance that we've gone through, uh, there's a few of these acronyms that we can throw out, AUP, APTC. Uh, the, the first one was actually under the guidance of uh, BIF. And then we transitioned kind of away from BIF, probably thought they were not really into uh, guiding that or but giving guidelines. They weren't supposed to be the governing arm of that, but they would give guidelines. So then we kind of transitioned into the Beef Breeds Council and that's where uh, we came up with APTC. APTC then transitioned into um, what we know today as Ultrasound Guidelines Council. Now, we've got some history buffs in here. If you see some things on here date-wise that is inaccurate, please let me know after this uh, so that I can get these corrected. Uh, anybody know how hard it is to find data, history on ultrasound over all these transitions? It is extremely difficult. Thank you to the American Angus Association because when I do a Google search, and I think it's something by the numbers, Man, by the numbers are great. I can go back quite a ways and find out old sound technicians and what equipment was being used. So some of this data actually comes from that, but uh, we've always been governed by someone 
And if you look at this name here, this old document I found actually in a file uh, where the very first APTC slash transitioning into UGC, Scott Griner sitting right there, he was on that first group that sat in there. Uh, and I put that up there to show the great minds that were involved in, in getting this where we are today. And again, where you're getting 12% of your cattle grading prime. I think that's pretty darn impressive uh, in, in the beef industry. And, and I, I just, it's, it's really neat how this has all happened. Now then, these dates, Mark, you might help me on some of these dates, but as I went back and I looked, uh, I believe that the first, quote, cup lab really started transitioning, probably started in 1998, 99, somewhere there, but we really didn't officially name it until 2001 is what I found in the literature. So, so I think that's pretty close to what happened. And soon after that, then we had uh, BIA, or livestock image analysis actually come in to be the second one. Right after that, then we had Ultra Insights. And somewhere along the way, we also had Biotronics. And this one is not in, if you go in the literature and you try to find that one, I cannot find exactly when they become a certified lab. So if, again, I was hoping Gina Doyle would be here and they could probably answer this one for me. But I, it looked like it's about 2004. Uh, but anyway, we're down to three labs that are actually governing this uh, what's really going on, and I, and, I, and I talked to Mark a while ago, I'm going to challenge some of these labs uh, of where we're at and where we need to be going and why we're not there already uh, as I get through part of my presentation, but um, I did go in and do a little bit of Google search on Biotronics. Has anybody looked up what's going on with Biotronics? They're doing some really cool work in swine, a lot of automated work in the swine industry. And I'm hoping that they transition back into the beef side of this so we can get some more automation going on. Because again, if we go back to Mike McNeil's response last year uh, with the research project with South Dakota, what did he say? If we could get labs to automate interpretation, one, we could reduce cost, we could limit variability uh, based off of what he saw. So I'm going to put a little pressure on some of these labs to actually get some more automation of this. Um, and, and again, we've got technology out there to get that done, and, and I appreciate Biotronics uh, kind of leading that in the swine industry. Now, let's do a quick little history here with uh, what we'll call the, the hardware components, because this is what's creating all the, heart, the, the heartaches, as far as I can tell. Um, when Dr. Stouffer came down in 80, I believe it was 89 when he was at Texas Tech, he had already kind of set things in motion to get this 17 two centimeter probe. Uh, I don't remember scanning with that until about 1989. Uh, other than him actually training us uh, to do some of those. Uh, they actually were direct selling those to us uh, by 1991 here in the States and, and it had moved up. But again, look at the timeline uh, that we're looking at there, 1991, and we're still using those units today. Uh, you saw in a previous presentation today, we had a 33% fail rate, I believe it was, in the old tech, the old Aloka. Uh, so one was that the technology, was it the software? Was it the technician experience? I would love to break that thing down and parse out what really happened in that particular failure rate at 33%. I think that's relatively high. Hopefully it goes back to inexperience by a technician along with old equipment is hopefully what we saw there. The classic medical, and I believe they call it this 200, uh, would have been around uh, probably 2000. This one I had a hard time finding. Mark probably knows better than I do on this one. Uh, was the Falco 100 about 2002 when it was actually approved? 2004 or five. Okay, so Sonovet was before the Falco. Okay, so I probably need to flip these two then maybe is where we need to go. Okay, again, it's very difficult to find that in the literature. Uh, Designer Jeans actually had automated software out in 2007, even though it wasn't I don't believe approved them, but it was approved shortly after that. Automated in terms of uh, they could at least go out and, and scan feedlot cattle to actually do those kind of things. So uh, the Kia Aquila, I think, was 2008. Again, Mark, I'll have to, yeah, 2008, Sonovet, which probably should have been moved up. And then I could not find, but because the Angus data that I could find, the Evo Ibex Pro uh, 2017. Okay, so I'll update that to 2017 moving forward. Uh, but this is kind of where these technologies have gone. But again, you go back to what I'm going to call the old gold standard. The Loca 500, whether that was near or old, that's what the industry kind of got used to. That's what breeders got used to. Uh, and, and, and again, I call it the old gold standard. If you look at these two images there, that's what the image quality looked like. 
And I'm going to tell you, I struggled with this new technology was out there. When I, when I put my hands on the Evo, and there's someone in the audience that got to watch me complain and cry about uh, the image quality, what was going on there. But that was the image you see on the screen, what I was actually accustomed to seeing, very bright, very crisp, uh, was easy for me to see. Now, if you go back in the literature, uh, we know that there's all kinds of training. And in my opinion, training matters for these technicians that are out there. And I think it even matters who trains those technicians makes a difference um, how good or how, how quality uh, they wind up being in the end. Uh, is a technician effect something we need to worry about? I remember back in probably 1998 or 1999, we had a guy we called Little Ribeye Leonard. Anybody know why we called him that? He always got smaller ribeyes because he always liked to skin next to the rib. And we know that that ribeye is going to be smaller if you do that. But there was not a problem with that because he did it consistently. He ranked the cattle according to the contemporary group and the EPDs would work itself out, right? But if you were trying to market those images, those values, you didn't hire him because he was always going to skip smaller ribeye and you couldn't brag to your neighbor that you had the, the biggest ribeye out there. So technician effect uh, does play a big, big part. So with that, uh, again, I'm going to say that the old Aloka, whether it's old or new, was the old gold standard. We can't get those parts anymore, right, Mark? They're just not there. If you found an Aloka, uh, a brand new one, buy it because you're not going to get another one. They're not going to make you another one. Now, I see technicians out there now buying these units, trying to use them, not knowing anything about them. And I wonder if they're part of the fail process that they bought a cheap unit that has been proven to work, but it's got problems. And then they're trying to get certified on those. Uh, but I'm going to say it's obsolete. The PA, uh, PXC card? Is that what card is in that thing? Or are there the software that uses that Aloka? Might have a, a different card that's also that I'm understanding is obsolete. If you can't even get that card now, the unit itself can't be repaired. You can't buy a new one. Why do we want to keep using that particular unit? So what we did, we decided that we would bite the bullet and we were going to buy uh, this new Fandango called the Evo. And it's got this large, heavy probe, and oh gosh, I was tired by the time I got through the end of the day scanning the cattle, and I would be considered somebody that scanned probably quite a few cattle. Uh, yeah, I was probably exaggerating it a little bit, but it is bigger, it is a little more bulky, and the image quality is harder to see in the beginning, but now I own one, and I think it's a pretty cool unit, okay? So we'll share some results with those, uh, what we actually did in this particular research project. We did collect the traditional uh, information you would have. Uh, I collected uh, data, which um, whether I'm experienced or not, I have scanned a lot of cattle, but we also had a graduate student, a PhD, who had never ever had an old sound unit in his hand. And I can attest to that when he picked it up the first time, he didn't have a clue what he was looking at. And we didn't train him. We just let him pick up both the gold standard and the new, and we let him scan those cattle. We independently collected those images. We actually randomized uh, how they came in. Those images then went to a certified cup lab. Uh, the data that I'm going to be presenting today with the, that data went to the Ultra Insights Lab uh, in Colorado. That's a, a, who actually interpreted these images uh, by both technicians. And I'll make a few comments uh, when we look at some of the results as well. Um, the LOCA with 17.2, that was the new unit. Uh, in this case, they were brand new units. Uh, I had just moved to West Texas a University and we were able to buy a brand new unit there. So it was not one that had been compromised. And the Evo we borrowed from University of Arkansas, which also knew had scanned very few cattle. It too had a big probe on it, just like the LOCA did. Uh, we scanned all these cattle prior to harvest. So it was one day uh, basically prior to harvest. Uh, cattle where data was collected at Tyson. And I'll just make a comment about that uh, at this point. Uh, and Patrick talked about it last year, I believe. Which one is real? Ultrasound data or packing carcass data? Which one's real? If you know Dr. Ty Lawrence, you know what his answer is to me, right? He's always right because he gets paid for what he calls it. But I still convinced that ultrasound is better in so many ways in so many instances especially in large groups where we're getting this data. Uh, but that's another day we can battle that one. But there are so many problems in carcass data collection when it's not done correctly uh, that I can sometimes have a problem with that and much, have, much rather have my data. Uh, the carcass data was a traditional that you would see would be collected. Uh, Dr. Lawrence did collect this data. Uh, he and his graduate students went and collected the data for us uh, the next day. Uh, animals were assigned random IDs. And what we did there, we did not want the scanning technicians to know 
what cattle they were, they were, and we did not want the lab to know. So we randomized those. We ran the cattle through uh, two different times. The first time they were ran through, uh, I scanned with the Aloka, Noah scanned with the Evo. The second time they came through in a totally different order, uh, I scanned with the Evo and Noah scanned with the Aloka. It's, it's, we, and we did that every time uh, that we scanned the cattle. And uh, we did have a, a question about, do the cattle scan different on each side? Because we did alter sides in these cattle, those kind of things. And, and my answer was, no, they're statistically not different, but that's a new research project we want to look at in the future. Uh, but in the case, we kept it consistent between the two, and, and hopefully that didn't throw any type of issues there. Now, this is one of those that, uh, again, these went to Ultra Insights. This is the image quality results that we got. Uh, even the experienced technician had two ribeyes kicked out with the Evo. Uh, I did not have any kicked out on the Aloka, but again, I was complaining a lot, and I probably didn't do as good a job as I should have with the Evo. Uh, but you also look at the IMF values there. I had 10, nearly 10% of my IMF images rejected on the Aloka. Anybody know why that happened? Probably Mark would know why that would happen since he processes some of those. Uh, we have been accused of collecting those images too fast and not independent measures, picking up the probe, setting them down, doing those kind of things. So they put a time on it and they were collected too close together and not considered independent. They kicked those out. Uh, is what happened there. Now then let's get to the inexperienced technician. Some of you that are out there hiring technicians that may have scanned 100 head in their life. Um, how confident can you be in those? If they're well-trained, I'm pretty confident in them, but you need to be careful when you're hiring these technicians to get out and do that. Uh, Noah had quite a few of his ribeyes, which is the hardest uh, uh, image to actually collect, and we know that, uh, and he had right at 40% of those rejected uh, with both technologies. He did a little better with the Evo, and he did like the Evo. That was his preferred uh, unit to actually be looking at. Um, for the cattle, we actually could not scan prior to harvest. They were so short and fat and wide, we couldn't get them through the snake. Uh, so we did not scan. They were traditional fat harvest ears, not the easiest ones in the world to scan. Now, if I throw these two images up to you, this is with the new technology. This is the Evo. And if I look at those, and I've looked at, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of images, are those different values? I'm sure the software is going to come back and call the one on the bottom right high marbling. The one on the left is going to be lower marbling. Is the one on the right blurred or is it not? So I, and I put this image up here because when I watch this Evo work and I scan them with this Evo, the, and I think its frame rate speed is so darn slow that it's just a different looking image when you compare with the old local we're used to. But the image quality, you can get it right at the same as you would with an aloka. And I'll show that with some correlations here in just a minute. But that would be typical what those images, and that's a really high marbling calf on the bottom right. I mean, he killed uh, relatively high. I think 8.81 is what he uh, killed at. Now, if we look at some of the stats in terms of how heavy these cattle were, uh, these cattle got uh, relatively large, you know, but they, they weren't unbearable. That, that's about the right size when you're going to stand feedlot cattle uh, if you're going to try to predict, especially on marbling on, on a kill. Uh, type on those cattle. Your grade three, again, not, not out of line, pretty, pretty typical of what you would have. Now, this slide here is a little interesting is, and you scientists in the room here and you start looking at this one, what's the first thing that jumps out to you? So we look at the fat levels on these cattle, um, anywhere from 1.5 to 1.7. But if you look between the technicians, the one with experience compared to the inexperienced and between the two systems, look what happens to the Evo fat thickness. It's increased in every case. Whether I was experienced or inexperienced on the high quality M's that were collected, we see that the Evo seems to call the cattle fatter. Now then, is that real? Uh, when we actually did this, we thought maybe perhaps it had to do with the standoff pad. But as we talk more to the lab technicians actually interpreting some of these images, they say the image is not as crisp or as bright and there's more buzzing of that line. I don't know that. I'm not sitting in the lab interpreting Evo images, uh, but we did see that we always, we consistently had more fat with the Evo. The good news is we didn't re-rank those cattle. I mean, it, the correlations were still just as good, which you'll see. Um, and, and again, about six tenths average on these cattle. So, you know, we had some fat cattle in there at 3.35 centimeters. That's a relatively fat cattle, uh, but we could do a pretty good job with those. Uh, ribeyes, 
again, when you look at the ribeye, statistically, they, they were not different between the evil and the local by technician, which is, again, is a good thing to me. Uh, the same technician getting basically the same value that's statistically not different, uh, which, which we like to see those kind of things there. Uh, we did slightly overestimate uh, ribeye size with both technologies, but it's relatively close until you look at correlations here in a minute, uh, which I'll show that to you as well. Uh, this would be the intramuscular fat values we got off of those. Again, we were slightly higher than what was going on in the carcass, but we did a really nice job of ranking these. Uh, and I was pleasantly surprised by the correlations that came out on the intramuscular fat models. Uh, the algorithms were really nice uh, coming out of Ultra Insights here uh, when you see those. Uh, but the range of these cattle were relatively low marbling to relatively high marbling. Yes. That's actual marbling score. He would actually call it 486 marbling score. That's correct. Yep, that's exactly right. And again, we slightly overestimated is, is what we did consistently, uh, even in the low end. Now then, when you look at the correlations across this, the top line is the one you want to look at. Um, I think everybody would be agreeable. Those are all very nice correlations. When you look at those, especially on this small of a data set, uh, when you look across, and you can look at the other diagonal lines there and see the correlation between technicians, biotechnology. Uh, again, very consistent, very, very nice to look at. Uh, these would be acceptable all day long. Again, this tells me again that the new technology, the Evo, which I'm guessing most folks are going to have to go to, uh, breeders should feel confident that they can use this new technology. They should not be afraid of their technicians using new technology as we move away from the old gold standard. Now, this one here becomes a little more complicated because Correlations look relatively low, don't they? Because if you look at that and you go in the literature, maybe those correlations have been 0 0.7, 0 0.75, some of those kind of things. Um, but again, they're consistent across the board. And, and again, I tell Ty that his data was incorrect. He clearly missed something when he collected the carcass data, um, but he swears that he didn't. Uh, but reality is reality, and I'm gonna show a comparable study to this one, the exact same correlations. Yes. Um, because I'm not a big fan of carcass data, uh, scan, uh, camera data, we do have that data, but I've not run in this analysis. So you're thinking maybe it's gonna be better, Ty's gonna be wrong. Yeah, we, we'll have that data. This is actually, I'm presenting this earlier than I'm supposed to. Noah's actually presenting this part of his PhD in uh, July. And this is the data he would actually give him, but he's got that analysis that he has not shared with me. Um, I'm hopeful this better, because I'm not proud of these correlations, but they are what they are, and again, old gold standard to new just seems like it's going to be uh, better. Now, these correlations, when you look at these, again, I'm very satisfied here because my expectations were not to get this good of a correlation out of uh, one of these labs on IMF because I've looked at some of the other correlations coming out of certification, those kind of things. I'm pleased with that right there. I mean, I'm really pleased that on, on actual carcass data that came out. Um, Noah struggled a little bit with the Aloka, but Noah's very much like I was with the Evo. He was not happy with the Aloka. He didn't want to scan with the darn thing. He wanted the fancy new Evo uh, because it's really small. And if you've never seen the Evo, it's picking up a very small box, like a little Apple uh, computer box and carrying it out to the uh, shoot with you. It's really, really neat and simple. Uh, and that's what uh, the beauty of that machine that I like as well. Uh, and, and it's just one of those things I really do like. Now then, this is the only data that I could find in the literature where we actually had this same kind of comparison. This was work that was not published, but it was work done by Ultra Insights, and I suppose Craig Hayes was the guy that scanned these cattle. Uh, the numbers were about the same numbers as we had in our research project. Um, if you look at, again, Evo compared to Aloka, again, a highly experienced technician collecting that data, you look at those correlations of 0 0.78, 0 0.68, 0 0.8, very similar to what we saw in our research project. So again, gives me confidence that this new technology is gonna be the wave of the future. And, and breeders should have confidence that we can scan these cattle. Technicians that have some experience can actually go out and collect this data. Uh, I think they'll do a really nice job. But again, if you look at this data compared to what we had, it's very, very similar. Let's move on to a second project that we did. This is totally different project, but this one goes back to Dr. Dykeman. And I talked to him when I got here this week. Uh, about the old project was done in the 1980s on Brangus cattle and what was the optimum time to actually be scanning seed stock cattle. What is the optimum time to scan bulls or seed stock 
EPD calculation. Someone throw me a number out there. Dr. Dykeman's research said 365 days at year length, right? He didn't say to scan them at two years old, did he? That data said scan them at 365 days. So we're going to look at that. In this particular project we did here, we scanned cattle. Uh, there was 120 involved in the project. But we only utilized eight of those in the project. And we serially harvested these cattle uh, every 42 days, I believe it was, or 56. I, I don't know. It, anyway, I'll show it here in just a minute. I think it's every 42 days we're actually killing harvesting these cattle, uh, eight of those in pairs. And we were comparing carcass data to what we were getting ultrasound. Flavio Ibera, Dr. Ibera is in the audience right here. He was the first one that started this project. He scanned the first three or four sessions um, when the cattle were light and small and easy to scan. Right, doctor? Yeah, uh-huh. And then I, he takes a job with the industry and leaves academia, and I do the other direction. I leave industry and I go into academia, and I wind up scanning the last six or seven times when the cattle got extremely large. How big can we make these cattle and still scan them with confidence with this ultrasound equipment? Uh, the biggest calf we scanned in this project is 2,099 pounds. And you guys complaining at certification where they were too dang big and fat to scan, Go scan a set of those kind of cattle and tell me what you think about them. Uh, we also had the A mode, which is Dr. Garrison, you see there on the right-hand side. Um, and he was actually not playing fair with us. He would watch Flavio scan and he'd find exactly where he put the rump fat measurement. He'd put his A mode at the same spot. Then I'd scan, he'd do the same thing. He'd put it, but he'll tell you, he'll agree to you that, that he did that. We saw no difference in just the fat depth of measure with A mode. Even though it's cheap, it doesn't add anything to, to the value of these. Uh, this is just a little bit about the cattle, uh, just so you get a, a kind of a feel that they were actually either treated pretty aggressively with uh, implants or they were just basically just allowed to grow and grow and grow is what happened to them. Um, they were weaned on the truck coming from Idaho. They were Simplot cattle. Simplot has a nice little model that, and I don't know what all went into the genetic component of that where they sorted those into pairs. Uh, they are actually fed in groups of pairs, and then we harvested them the same way uh, when they came out. Uh, they, they came in in August. The first, what we'll call day minus seven, was in September. Uh, Flavio got the uh, luck of actually scanning those cattle. Uh, they were given EIDs. All these kind of things went on. Hip height. Uh, if you've ever seen Dr. Max Garrison's uh, program work, he's in your way all the time while you're trying to scan, but he's doing all these measurements and width and height and all those kind of things. But it was a really, really good project, a neat project with about five graduate students in, involved in this. They got uh, master's degrees or PhDs out of it. It was it was a really neat, but we did group them in pairs. They're fed in pairs. We had 40 extras that if we needed them, uh, we had them. You'll find in the end that we did not wind up using those uh, in the end, which is really good. Uh, we either had the 40 controls, the 40 uh, implanted cattle, um, we did keep 40 around just to compensate. These are the days on feed. Again, 378 days on feed of wean calves. And it is amazing what those cattle look like. And, and I don't, Flava, you didn't get to come and see those at the end, I don't believe. Uh, but those cattle just kept growing and growing and growing and growing. And, and when we look at the data, runt fat was the most intriguing one of all of them. These cattle kept getting fat externally. Uh, on the 12th rib fat, but it seemed like they plateaued on the rump fat. Uh, so meat science uh, scientists in here, I'm curious how that plays out on these cattle. And how big can we really make these guys, uh, which is really incredible what we can do. Uh, day zero, we actually kill some of these cattle. Uh, poor Flavio had to scan some of these that probably weighed 600 pounds or, or less, had no fat on them, but we we're trying to predict fat on those cattle. Um, and that's just what, I, at day 190, we also did some further processing uh, on those cattle. Implant, again, implant as hard as we can. We did have two steers die out of 120. That's pretty impressive on calves that were weaned on a truck coming from Idaho to Canyon, Texas, uh, which was pretty darn neat. Uh, we did have to remove nine of those calves that were not part of the study uh, because they did founder. I mean, those cattle were just getting fat. I mean, they were just terrible. Uh, but but we, we did collect that carcass data, and that's not in this analysis. Uh, but in the final analysis, uh, Noah will actually look at that and, and actually apply some of that to it. Uh, we did have growth safe data, which I'm not going to share today, but I want you to know that there is growth safe data. We're going to look at uh, maybe as some type of predictor uh, of some of our endpoints that, that we might want to look at. This is the diet that they would have had. Again, pretty darn traditional of what you'd expect. Um, and this, these were done at the agri-research, uh, Dr. Bechtel's uh, research feedlot. 
Uh, some of you that really want to look at the statistics of this, uh, uh, Dr. Lawrence is always big on this and make sure you knew that it was a block design and he, he designed it all perfectly uh, because that's what his strength is and, and he'll tell you that he's got the stats down. Um, this one basically just shows that uh, I scan the big fat hard to scan cattle, Flavio scan those little lightweight, easy to scan, everybody wants to get certified on little cattle uh, kind, but you'll see the correlations here in a minute on who did the best job. Uh, and when we should actually be scanning these cattle. All of the images were saved to, and I don't remember how we even got these to you, Mark, but we did send those to the Cup Lab uh, in Ames, Iowa. They processed all of those just as if they were seed stock cattle, and they process, process them every time, and we appreciate them doing that. Um, we did not blindly uh, score those animals. They were given IDs every time, but uh, again, not, we didn't make a big deal out of that. Uh, all cattle were scanned with both units. I'm not sure why. I'd, um, oh, this one here is basically just to, to remind me, uh, does implanting impact what these softwares are actually calling in terms of marbling scores and those kind of things? And you'll see here in just a minute that really the treatment of, did not have an effect in these cattle uh, based on the ultrasound uh, unit that was going on. Um, And this is just tell me, dang, these cattle were hard to scan. And I feel sorry for the lab that processed these images. And I don't know that we had very many rejected, uh, but these cattle got really, really hard to scan uh, in the end. So if you look at the, the mean data here, 933 kilograms. Again, the highest one that we could get on the scale, uh, he actually was at 2105. Uh, and then we said, are you sure? We rebound scales and he was 2099. Uh, and that's the biggest one we got. But uh, Dr. Abero was actually scanning those cattle and there was as small as a 239 kilogram calf in there. And th those eight of those calves died at, at very young cattle. I um, mean, they were just lightweight cattle. Uh, but again, if you look at the ranges that, that you see in there, and we're gonna kind of work off of the means today, which is pretty traditional what you would see uh, if you just take the means. But I'm more interested in the days that we scan these cattle and what those correlations look like. And if it goes again back to uh, that bring us data of Dr. Dykeman's and Chalice that really said uh, when we should be ultrasounding these cattle. But again, they, and if you look at the, the uh, dressing percentage of these cattle, very typical 63 to 64%. If you do those calculations, they're very similar. Now then let's look at these correlations and I just put a box around this 210 days. Uh, so if you look at prime opportunity to actually scan these cattle, again, to me, it falls at 210 days. Those cattle had been weaned basically on the truck. So let's just assume they're about 205 days old. That puts them at 415, goes back to the data back in, again, uh, Kansas State University has said, suggested perhaps yearling might be the time to actually scan these cattle. Uh, again, we're only talking eight animals per harvest time. So take that with a grain of salt when you look at this data. But again, this is very encouraging to me uh, as we look at that, that we can Again, sort these cattle, and, and, and you just look at the correlations on ribeye. When you go down that chart, the bigger those cattle got, the fatter they got, what happens to ribeye correlations? You know you're gonna lose part of that because part of that's the technician not getting the best image. Some of that's part of the lab interpretation when you get there too. And it really gets complicated when you take the carcass itself and they're trying to take an 18 square inch ribeye and dissect it when it may have should have been bigger. Uh, it seemed like we were actually getting bigger ribeyes than were getting interpreted uh, from uh, the lab. The, the lab was, or the carcass data was actually a little smaller. Can we live with those types of correlations at 210 days on feed? I think you can. I think everybody would be very happy with that. Uh, in terms, I think you could back up to 168 days, you could go up to 252 days, but that range again fits the model we've been doing since 19, 82 or whenever that, that research paper came out. Uh, it's still sound. It looks like it's what we need to be doing. Uh, we can now look at control versus treatment. If you want to look at some of those, again, heavy influence with the implant, and you would expect the cattle to be heavier. You would expect the ribeyes hopefully to be larger. And in all those cases, you see what, again, biologically you would expect. That's kind of what we see uh, going on there. Uh, but in this case here, if you throw them all together, uh, there was really, um, we were just as good whether they had an implant or not, at least to a, a, a comparable weight. When those cattle started getting 17, 1800 pounds, they got where they didn't want to come into a chute. A matter of fact, the cattle got so big, we had to move two different chutes to get to these 
get them big enough to actually scan these guys here. Uh, this is again going back to the 210 days. If you're actually out there scanning those cattle, uh, where do you want to scan them out? How big a rib are you confident that the technology can do? How fat can you make them? Again, drives me back to 210 days. Uh, again, I, it just makes me uh, glad to know that the technology is still where we really need it to be. Uh, this is on percent fat uh, versus rump fat. And I'm going to go back again so you can see this rump fat compared to what's happening in the 12th rib fat thickness. Look at the trends in rump fat. And it's interesting to me, and we haven't broken this all out yet to actually see what's going on there, but look what happens in the treatment versus the control in rump fat. And I say this because I've scanned enough Brahmin influenced cattle that this is a different phenomenon that goes on in Brahmin influenced cattle. Anybody know the Brahmin influence? When we get on the rump fat, we get twice as much rump fat on Brahmin cattle than we do on the rib. You can scan a rib of high influence, Brahmin influenced calf, scan the 12th rib, multiply it times two, and you've about got the rump fat consistently. Now that I'm interested in feeding a set of cattle that are not Charlotte Angus that might have a little bit of Brahmin in them and see what happens to this rump fat. And does this tell us a, a bit more? Uh, and the biceps femoris muscle, anybody seen that one and scanned that one? Uh, Dr. Lawrence has got me involved in this one where we're looking at the biceps femoris and how much marbling is laid down in the biceps femoris muscle. And you'd be, you would understand that image based off a of rump fat image. And if we move that image over to the right to the hook bone and you see more biceps femoris exposed, it is incredible how much marbling we see in that muscle in some of these cattle. Now then, is that related to how much marbling's in the rib or not? A research project needs to be done on that and, and hopefully will be done soon uh, on some higher, uh, at least a Brahmin influenced cattle. Uh, but I'm gonna back up again and let you look at the FTU part of that, the 12th rib fat thickness and see what happened there. Those cattle just kept getting fatter and fatter and fatter at the 12th rib, even though we were not seeing at the, the rump. Uh, which again, I think I would have seen different if they had had some Brahmin influence in those cattle. Uh, but when you see that graph and you plot those two together, it's pretty, pretty cool to see what's going on there. Uh, other than that, that pretty looks, in my opinion, looks pretty darn normal. That's what the cattle looked like closer to the end. Uh, the cattle didn't really get tall. They just kept getting wider and wider and thicker. Uh, and just, I don't know how big we could have made them. I just don't, I, they would just kept going, I think. Uh, we could have just kept feeding them and keep scanning them, I believe. Uh, they got awful, uh, awful uh, large there. So um, now then, I went through sheep certification about a month ago, and I watched these sheep guys, and, and I hate scanning sheep, to be honest with you. You're on your knees and hands, and they're small and those kind of things. Uh, but we had a technician pull out a repro probe, and they actually scanned these sheep with a repro probe and certified a little three centimeter probe. And all they do in Australia is when they scan these, cow these sheep, they're actually doing loinite depth. And they've got some type of algorithm they're projecting what loinite area is gonna be. And they basically get a fat thickness. And they were using a repro probe to do that. Okay, so if I, the reason I put this slide up here is because I'm gonna challenge the, the labs. We've got three labs and potentially four of those labs out here that if I want to make this technology get to the next level, we have to get the cost down in so we can use it in a feedlot. And I keep sitting and I look at the number of feedlot cattle just around Canyon, Texas, and I get calls often. Can you come in and scan these cattle for basically intramuscular fat to sort them? And I say, yes, I can, but it's going to cost me five, seven, eight dollars, whatever it's going to cost me to scan them. They will not pay that. If we've got a little handheld unit, and, and I've used one of these, this little handheld unit and sit there and get a IMF measure, and this unit here costs you $4,000, $5,000. Uh, I'm gonna challenge the, the labs that are here or anybody else that wants to be independent, go out there and do that. Somebody needs to jump on this and start getting us for feedlots. Because again, I go back to John Brethauer. If he were here today, I think he would already use this unit in the feedlot and been scanning these cattle and have algorithms. So I go out there with a little handheld unit, battery operated, and I'm gonna scan a thousand head of feedlot cattle sorting the day into choice, select, whatever. Um, and again, we've got systems smart enough now that we should be able to do this. And I have so much confidence in labs. I know that their algorithms work for marbling. Let's get to some of these new generation uh, technology. Now, can we ever predict ribeye area from a, in cattle from a ribeye depth? I don't know that. I'm not sure I'm confident in that one, 
but I think that we can use these units and certainly use them in the feedlots to sort to make at least sorting decisions to make money for these guys. Uh, so I challenge the labs to do those. Uh, automation, uh, and I don't know, Patrick, if, if it were you or somebody talking about machine learning, uh, if we are that good at machine learning, why can't we train? Uh, because I, I look at labs, how many of us sit into a lab and actually interpret these images all day long? Scott Griner's done some of it. Flavio's done some of it. Why can't we just train your software to do it? Let your software do it. Image quality by your technicians are excellent. Let the software do that, as Dr. McNeil said, and let's minimize some of that, that variability that I think we've got. Uh, so I, I just want to challenge some of these labs to actually do some of those. Now, if we look at these two images, can anybody tell the difference without, I know Mark, some of those guys can look at those, uh, but are those quality images, whether, which technology you use? Yes, sir. Oh, well, they should drop the lights then. Do you know how to do that? Yeah, and I wish I could walk around now. All right, with that, I'm going to say, and we're going to get the lights dropped so you can see that. Those are images, two different pieces of equipment. Image quality, in my opinion, are excellent with both of those, and we can, can use those. With that, I'm going to quit and try to answer questions that you might have. Maybe we can go reverse that. If you need to make it real dark for a second, you can. Oh, that's way better. Yeah, I knew you were going to say that, Flavio. I thought the next thing you were going to say is because your bald head wasn't shining on that light, you could probably see better too. So, all right, look at those images. And I just believe that image quality with the newest technology got out there, you can't tell the difference unless you really know these units, uh, but which unit actually scanned those. Uh, so, again, I'm asking new technicians that are going to listen to this probably later on uh, go out there and buy those Evos, quit buying those old Locas and trying to get by with that. Uh, the industry doesn't need it. We need you to step up and use the new unit. And I'm not taking away from other units. I'm just telling you, this is the unit I've used. Uh, hopefully in the future, we'll use some of the other technologies that are out there uh, in head-to-head -head comparisons as well. Uh, but the new generation ultrasound units do work. Breed associations should have confidence in those moving forward. That's the base reason I've got that. All right. With that, I'm going to let you ask questions if you have any. Marbling score from the carcass. 486, so the average is 486. We actually moved the decimal place over to 4.86. We did not convert that. No, no, that's actually the raw data from the lab. Yeah, he did, but he did not share them with me. Again, he did not want me to share this data with you because he's doing it July, and he didn't really want me to share this, but I was already committed that I was going to share this data. But we do have the data, and it actually looks really good. It's pretty impressive, actually. So I guess I should add another to that, which... Um, and I've asked Mark to actually do this. We have actually had these images interpreted by two different labs as well. So he'll have those stats between two different labs with those two different systems. Uh, I have looked at the initial data and it's incredibly awesome data. It's, there's really no difference in the labs. Uh, the one thing I did see that one lab was a little better in ribeye area interpretation than the other, but the other was better in fat and marbling interpretation. Only slight differences, statistically not different. Uh, and I hope that we can get a third lab to actually compare those. I think that would be good for the industry to put all three of those together and show that, dang, all three labs are working with these new technologies. 